All right, so let's call this evening's meeting to order. This is the Board of Public Works, June 25th, 2014. And uh, first item of business will be public comment. If anyone in the public would like to... Well, you're not going to get two weeks in a row, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Uh, this may be appropriate, but make me unpopular tonight for saying this. But this is a copy of an email I sent to Bill Dwight regarding the uh, crosswalks. Bill, some thoughts about crosswalks. All crosswalks in the city appear to be of exactly the same design. They have the same width of white lines and the same space in between them. There must be some state or federal standards dictating this, which was determined by numerous safety studies. Crosswalks are conflict zones between pedestrians and drivers of motor vehicles. Drivers have been conditioned to look for crosswalks that have a particular paint design. What is the negative safety factor of cross with crosswalks start to take on different designs and different colors. In addition, some people are biologically colorblind. What may appear as a rainbow of colors to some people <coughs> appears as various shades of gray to those who are naturally colorblind. What happens when one of these people hits a pedestrian because the crosswalk was not of the standard design? Can the city be held liable for deviating from the standard design? Northampton wishes to begin a street art program that should be done in some other location besides a crosswalk. A large rainbow was painted in the middle of Main Street between crosswalks. I doubt if anyone would object. With the recent painting of the rainbow crosswalk, the city has opened a Pandora's box for any and all groups which wish to express their identity in the, in the form of a unique crosswalk. Shamrocks for St. Patrick's Day, flag, Italian flag colors for Columbus Day, MIA images for Veterans Day, and the list is endless. It's time for the city to find another way to show appreciation for various groups without modifying our crosswalks and compromising pedestrian safety. Um, you, you're welcome to comment now, but we'll come to your item That's in a moment. Fine. Okay. Great. Uh, next for your consideration, the, we're looking for your approval on the minutes of the June 11th BPW meeting. Move approval. Second. Any comments about You got my comments. I did. Okay. Ro and Mike made comments on the first meeting minutes and Mike made a few on the second. Okay. So Ro I'll couldn't find anything, she said. <laughs> near perfect. So all in favor of approving the minutes from the June 11th meeting? Aye. Aye. And now the minutes of the May 14th meeting? I'm just abstaining from that vote because I wasn't present. Okay, so one abstain. <coughs> I have a motion on May 14th. Move approval. Second. Okay. And, and again, so Mike has made some comments. Mm -hmm. Incorporated. All in favor of approving the minutes of May 14th? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, in new business, Kathy Osborne is here uh, to talk to us about the possibility of making a red, white, and blue crosswalk. The crosswalk um, across from Pulaski Park heading toward uh, Fresh Pasta. Um, so yes, um, my name is Kathy Osborne. I'm the Assistant City Manager for Pulaski Park. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yep. Um, my husband's a veteran and we started talking after the Rainbow Crosswalk was put out we really like it and thought it improved visibility and safety you know whatever that uh, other letter was talking about but um, thought it might be really nice to honor the veterans being that so many people in the city we know are veterans and um, my husband being a veteran himself and so we started just talking to friends who said they would gladly contribute some money to it we have a lot of money potentially pledged um, so I came in to try to get some more information on what the process is, what the cost is, what the commitment is, what the possibilities are, and it sounds like there might need to be a discussion of guidelines for the city. Just, you know, we really liked the Rainbow Crosswalk and thought it would be really nice in that location to honor the veterans near Memorial Hall if it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. So I came to explore that with you. Thank you. So it strikes me that, just speaking for myself, that. As, as Kathy said, she came to see what the procedures are, what's the process, and it strikes me we don't have either procedures or process um, regarding this. The first decision was made very ad hoc, mm -hmm. very like, yeah. So there's precedent even though there's, there's precedent, but there's no procedure, there's no process, there's no, we have no methodology for this. 
Um, and I had been thinking before it's time to repaint the rainbow crosswalk, we should really take some time to think about that. You know, when it's time to like freshen it up. I mean, is that was this a one-shot deal? Is this something in perpetuity? Who's going to pay for it in perpetuity? How does this work? We just haven't thought this through. It seems to me. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I think it. Okay. I think it, that the rainbow sidewalk or crosswalk adds an incredible vibrancy. I really like it, and it really gives people come to look at it. And uh, I like the idea. I think art in the downtown, however we decide to install it, is a wonderful thing. And you know, when it honors particular groups, especially the veterans, I think it's a great thing. We have a long history of honoring veterans here mm -hmm. at the VA hospital. I like to acknowledge it. I, and yes, the the rainbow that we did was at hoc, but I think. It really excited some, some some visual appeal, some mm -hmm. new visual appeal in the day. <coughs> so what what's the process? For example, who buys the paint next time? Well, we we sort of had a precedent on how we did it with the rainbow, right? They they raised the money for the paint, and do we call paid. them? I mean, what's what? That's what I'm saying. What's our? And it needs to do be we redone. call oh. them? Do we get a phone number and we call them when it's time to put fresh paint down? Mm -hmm. Does fresh paint tend to need to go annually? Would it be just an annual one or two years? Would that yeah. be yeah. years? Uh, it depends on the paint. Uh, down, I mean, the, the sidewalks or crosswalks themselves in the high traffic volume areas are usually done twice a year, done in the springtime and then fall before winter. So, do, you know, I mean, so, mm -hmm. just we, we, there's, there's questions that I would argue are worth coming up with a piece of paper where we say, crosswalk, that's a great idea here at the you know, this is the... It seems to me that there are at least two aspects to this. One is one is the one we're good at, which is the technical aspect. Uh, what kind of paint should we pick? You know, our crews can do the work. You know, that's that seems to be sort of within our purview. And then there's this artistic, political aspect to it. And um, I question whether this board should be making those decisions on behalf of the city. And I'm not even sure we did the last time. You know, I think multiple groups, including the city council, were involved in the process. It just wasn't, it was a little helter skelter. We heard it formally from a couple of councils. Um, and we've, we've, we have two examples in front of us that seem to me to be um, sort of uh, uh, warrant broad um, support from the city residents. Um, but I could certainly imagine a group coming that perhaps doesn't get that broad support from the city. And so is it up to this board to say, no, we don't like your cause and your political statement, so we don't think that's appropriate for this community, but we do think these other ones are. And I don't really think that's up to this board. I mean, we're the Department of Public Works. We're not the Department of Public Statements. <laughs> you know, I just, so I, I'd like I'd like to see another entity in the city participate in in that sort of the political aspect of it. There is a newer ordinance that was passed by City Council for public art. I think that was from the last more than ninety days. Needs to go through the Arts Committee for the Arts Council. And I know this crosswalk did not, but in the future, if they are going to last more than 90 days, it would have to go through that process. I believe that was approved by City Council in the past two months or so, Mary, Council of Arts. Mm. Why didn't the other one go through it? I don't know offhand, to tell you the truth. Maybe because we were so new at it, we are sort of making it up as we were going it's, along. A, it's a fairly new ordinance that was passed. But the question is, do we consider this public art? And in my mind, it does seem like public art. And your points well taken. Like, you know, who should be making the decisions about what's allowable or what's acceptable? And that probably should not rest with this body. That should be a broader, or someone who's more focused on the downtown environment. I think so. And when we had the gentleman come that wanted to sell the sunburnt wood, we said we wanted to get the Arts Council involved in that because it was a arts issue. But the rep, sort of working in the direction of the politics, I 
think we need to join with a larger group to, to um, think about that. So the issue is whether it's just, if it's art, then do we go to the art council or do we involve um, the city council? So that's or the mayor's issue. office. Or the mayor's office, exactly. So one of the things we struggled with the rainbow crosswalk was how are we going to meet the MUTCD standard? And we'd have to look at this the same way too. We have to make sure that there's a certain amount of white has a certain reflectivity and it's so big and so wide, so long and so on. And that's where, because um, at the TPC meeting, Transportation Parking Commission, uh, Chief Sinkowitz was very concerned about being an enforceable crosswalk too, mm -hmm. that you could write tickets off of. And this is why we look at the MUTC for guidance and that's how we came up with the alternating pattern of color and white, color and white, so that we can meet that standard. So is it fair to say we all agree that we need to put a little thought into some kind of a process? And, and I, I agree with Mike, and I, I think maybe we all agree that we need a broader, either a vote at the city council or a formal declaration rather than an informal one from the mayor mm -hmm. saying, yes, please make this happen. And then our focus becomes technical. Mm -hmm. Paint shall be such and such, application shall be such and such. Right. I large. also would suggest, since she is honoring our veterans, to have the our veterans agent, Steve Connors, and the veterans be involved in it. Sure, sure. I mean, I can imagine the veterans agent speaking with the city council or the mayor's office or whoever it is that they were looking for participation from. And they and could come into social services and veterans and culture and recreation. Yes, sir. And before, we, when the first group came, they had raised the money, they had talked to various groups about money. But in this case, if, we, if it happens too often, you do get into that realm of if you have the money, then you can do that. And I'm not sure that we want, I'm not comfortable with the idea that because people have the money that they can do something like this. And um, so that's another aspect of this that we need to consider. So how do we um, develop the process? <coughs> Let's see, I hate it. Of course, a city engineer could do it. Oh, yeah. oh, Develop a process? I'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> when do you want it? Uh, well, can we read the could it be a little subcommittee of our board that comes up with... Uh, but, but it sounds like it's a broader process, not just DPW. It sounds like we might want to suggest that you, you start at the mayor's office with this type of request. Or what about the joint committee? <gasps> I like it. So we should take this to the, what do you think about that? We take it to the joint committee at their next meeting. It's August 4th. It's, it's a little bit of a wait. I mean, it's not. August 4th, I'll be traveling. My husband might be able to come in okay. and do the proposal. Mm -hmm. um, we can still put it on the agenda. Oh yeah, I mean, so I'm thinking that we need to um, get busy coming up with a process for this. We, we, we don't, I don't think we have a good answer for you this evening because we don't have any process. Uh, but it's, it's a great question, and we're very interested in doing it if we can make it happen. So just keep me, I guess, posted as the process evolves. You know, Veterans Day is in November. Maybe we could keep our fingers crossed and have it done by Veterans Day. It sure seems like that's a reasonable mm -hmm. goal. Yeah, so. <coughs> so BJ, could you um, add that to the agenda for August 4th? Mm -hmm. Great. Is that, oh, is that you? And I have your email. Thank you. So I we'll try to keep you. you involved. And That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming in. Uh, next, uh, for your consideration, a contract for the purchase of 52 acres of watershed land on Rocks Road in Hatfield in the amount of $60,000. <coughs> this would be paid for out of the Water Enterprise Fund. Move approval. Okay. map, which everybody has. Um, 
partial and question is in red at the bottom here. You can see that the majority of the 52-acre parcel falls within the watershed for the Mountain State Reservoir. So important acquisition for us that the board previously um, had approved the offer. Um, the parcel is front of John Ruff Road. It's a vacant woodlot right now and is adjacent to the reservoir. Um, the purchase price is $60,000 and the, the money to purchase this will come on with the water enterprise fund. And it's pretty steep. The water is rushing into the reservoir. Yeah, it's an important piece. The reservoir, the watershed for Mountain Street actually, as you can see, is, is fairly small. And this is pretty close to the spillway. Yep. Okay. I'm sorry, is this is, is this the price that we um, authorized the negotiation for? Yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Question number three. You can see the two adjacent parcels we recently acquired from Benny and I forget the other gentleman's name. Martin. Two green ones. Martin. 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 So where's the border with Hatfield and Haydenville? That red and green line to the left of is it the dash line near uh, elevation 195? It's running uh, vertically? Yes. No, it's weekly. I think it's the one that's running mm -hmm. vertically. Near 195? Yeah. There's, there's one right here that comes mm -hmm. up through here. This is the Hatfield Bloomsburg. Oh, and okay. then this one here coming across is the uh, Waitley um, Williamsburg Town Line, so uh, that's okay. kind of the corner of no, so it doesn't have Ohio Field. Yeah, the west side of the property is a butt Williamsburg. That's the line there. Got it. Hmm, I didn't realize it, the Hatfield came out of that property. All right, well, um, are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor of approving this purchase? Aye. Aye. Next, we have a con uh, for your consideration a contract for Eastern Avenue of Drainage Improvements to JL Ray, Ray Mockers and Sons in the amount of $132,000. And this would be coming out of the new Stormwater Enterprise Fund. No, only one. Okay. Our first expense. It's just everyone else is sitting there on the single page. It's one signature. And every other page is another individual signature because they all look at different communities and states. All the sellers. So I asked Nicole, she said to sign one page to the back page for the board. Okay. Okay. Sorry, technical. No problem. Technical problem. Sorry. Right. Resolved. <laughs> so Eastern Avenue of drainage improvements. So uh, this project involves uh, drainage improvements in Eastern Avenue and also some drainage improvements along the levee system. Um, so it sort of um, takes care of two issues. One, um, problems along the levee that have been cited by FEMA and uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers in their routine inspections of the levee system. And then also deals with some uh, drainage issues along Eastern Avenue, et cetera. Um, we received Six bids for the work. Uh, the low bid for Raymakers and Sons is $132,676.50. The high bid, the high bid was Gomes Construction, $218,770. Um, and most of the uh, <coughs> most of the bids were in the $160,000 range. So we had a, we had a fairly tight uh, range of bids. So is this, in terms of the levees, is this addressing the tow drains? What's, what part of this is responding to the core? Not specifically a tow drain issue, but uh, an issue of sinkholes along the levee system that were related to um, drainage problems from this drainage system that comes down Eastern Ave and runs parallel to the levee, right near the tow. Okay. So not specifically a tow drain issue, but but this directly responds to requirements that they've 
listed as it, it does yeah. and they were happy when they were out a couple weeks ago and we told them that we were taking care of it so, so is, this the is this the first money we're spending on the stormwater enterprise it's like the the very first dollar, I don't know if it's the very first dollar, it's the first capital project. Will we have this much cash actually in, in the fund? The, 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 the way it works is that um, once it's been appropriated through the budgeting process, it's available to be spent. We don't have to wait until someone pays a stormwater bill and accumulate money that we can spend. There's, there's with $100 million circulating through the city, We'll be we'll be okay, at least for a few months. Um, so, all in favor? Are we ready for a vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor of approving this contract for the drainage improvements? Aye. Aye. Uh, next, a we have to consider a contract for aluminum sulfate to Holland Company in the amount of nineteen thousand dollars, and this is for the water enterprise. Move approval. Second. This is an annual contract for the water treatment plant for a coagulant we use it for. Uh, last year's price was a half a cent higher than this year's price. And for bidders this year we had another second high bidder was Slack Chemical at a dollar forty four per gallon. So quite a quite a change, quite a differential between the two. What's the price of the contract? Uh, $19,000. I mean the unit price. The unit price is 95 cents per gallon. Last year's was, excuse me, last year was more expensive, 98.5 cents a gallon. So it's three and a half cents a gallon, more expensive last year. And then we had a no bid from uh, Chemtrade Chemicals. So do we go through this much every year, or is, yes. is it this? This is this an annual lot that we have. We try to buy all our chemicals in a one year uh, period. But sometimes they have an extension. I don't believe this one has an extension on it. It's just one no. year contract. No, I just like the charcoal, we're trying to level the funding. No, this the, one doesn't. This is just an annual it's one enough line item. For one year only. 20,000 gallons, I think. Any other questions or comments? All in favor of approving the contract for aluminum sulfate? Aye. 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 Next, a contract for bituminous concrete complete in place to Warner Brothers in the amount of $1,861,000. This is coming with the general fund. Actually, Chapter 90, I suppose. We it's coming from uh, Chapter 90 and the capital improvements money, about 500000 this year. Uh, we had three bidders on this. Um, low bidder was Warner Brothers at uh, $1.861 million. My bidder was laying construction at 2.094 million. Uh, pretty much it follows the list that had been circulated. We have a memo from Jim um, and staff here a few weeks ago at the board meeting. Uh, a lot of work to be done. Nice, nice size contract. Yeah. So will this now that this contract's in place, will this allow? Is the pavement memo online? I think it's online. It is. So will this allow that to become more specific at this point? Just in terms of the contract being signed, but we don't we won't have a specific rollout of which streets until we meet with the contractor at the kickoff meeting. But that will be forthcoming at some point. Mm -hmm. Great. So this covers everything on our list. It does. Wow. Uh, not the box paving. No, the mill and the mill and all the way in the reclaim. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, as it was described in the memo, it covers everything. Wow. Yeah. That's great. The crack ceiling work is starting on Friday, is my understanding. That's already a contract you already did sign. Right. And how about the rubber chip seal? We right. signed that one too. That That's been signed. I don't have a date for starting construction yet. But all the, you know, as we have information, that'll all get filtered into the, the, the document online. So that I just came back from the mayor's office yesterday. Yeah. <coughs> so it's approved. Nope. No. All right. We'll tap for your signatures. All in favor of approving the contract for the uh, asphalt, the pavement work. Aye. 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 Terrific. Um, the next is the appointment of a board member to the tree committee. Um, Lily Lombard came into the joint committee the other day and made a presentation. 
actually it's a pretty interesting presentation. She is making the case that we ought to consider funding a, um, a permanent arborist position attached to the Department of Public Works. This might be full-time, might be half-time, might be, but something permanent. Her, her argument in part is that her primary argument is trees are far too important. We are clearly losing um, dozens of shade trees annually and have been as far back as she had records for, um, which she sees as a, a something to be, something that requires our attention. But also her argument in part is that the tree committee is kind of dead in the water without a budget, without someone spearheading it, and without some kind of statutory authority. Um, all of which would be somewhat addressed if we had a, an arborist permanently in the, in the mix. Um, it's kind of an interesting argument. And I understand from her and from the way she made the presentation that the tree committee is sort of dead at the moment. Um, they can't get a quorum is right. yeah. the explanation I agree. <clears throat> oh, it hasn't been discontinued, but there's no, it's not active, there's no quorum, there's no. So I wonder if, are they short one person? I mean, do they need our person or do we need the to The mayor asked that this happen with the board member being appointed as an interim period until we get a new board member on board to see if they want to do it. Okay. So that we try to fulfill the requirements of the tree committee with a quorum at meetings. Oh, okay. so we're, they're often one short? They're, my understanding is it's a group of seven, if I recall correctly, and they have two or three or four active members, but they don't need because they don't have a quorum. Okay, so we could help. Well, well uh, and I also think that they stopped meeting because they felt a little disempowered or didn't feel like they had authority to do what they wanted to do. I mean, it sounded like they... It's been the problem been all along. I know that they've been working hard, but didn't feel like they had any support. That group has never really been the same since David left. <laughs> what was it like before? <laughs> were you on the, you were the, the tree committee? Before Chris. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, it ought to be someone with experience. <laughs> someone who knows his way around. Got a dog. Would you be willing, David, on a, at least a temporary basis to consider sure. rejoining that? Yeah. Nice. I make a motion that we nominate David <laughs> to be the uh, temporary appointment to the D of the DPW board member to the tree committee. Capital letters, temporary. <laughs> How swiftly the board acts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Second. <laughs> uh, are there any other nominations? <laughs> Hearing none, I will close the nomination period of this process. Uh, do you have any um, speech you'd like to make? <laughs> I, I want to vote. <laughs> so Mike has called the question. All in favor of appointing David to the uh, tree committee? Aye. 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 David, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, uh, next for a, a, new, a new item is a change order number five to contract 96-11 the Bradford Street Pumping Station Evaluation Design and Construction at Kleinfelder. And that's a time extension. We just need to pay some need invoices. Pay a bill. Yeah. Approval. Second. Second. This is long done, right? I was just a Well, I wouldn't say long done. The project is ready. The, the project is ready for bid except for um, some permitting that we're still doing. But uh, Kleinfelder has completed their obligations under the, the current contract, and we have a bill that um, that can't be paid unless we extend the time on the contract. Well, isn't the pumping station that that monster? Is the monster. I don't know. 
But there's some some bill is hanging around. There is a bill. We tried to send. We tried to pay it, and the contract ran out. Okay. And so I I we think it was the final bill, wasn't it? Yeah. So the project is is the project obviously has been done for a long time. We've been wrestling with the contract about the final landscaping, and there's still one pay requisition that we're actually doing from Schultz Construction to pay them. But we're not going to release the full retainage back to them because we held on to some of it so we could hire a local contractor to replace some of the plants. So this bill, I think, was for Kleinfelder to work with me on the on the change and release of retainage. So that's that's the drip that's the drill on this. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Any questions, questions or comments? All in favor of approving this change order to extend the contract? Aye. 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 Next. Uh, I was rocking out last night. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Stop asking me so many questions. <laughs> he doesn't have his tie on. He can't think. <laughs> uh, contract for pavement marking paint to um, Ennis Flint in the amount of $21,750. Mm -hmm. This must be general. Yeah, yeah, I forgot. I'm sorry. This is our annual contract for Central Line and Fog Line painting at City Streets. Uh, we had three bidders this year. One was no bid. The other high bidder was at $55,520, not much of a difference. Prices lowered just a little bit from last year, where last year we paid uh, $10.20 per gallon for white, this year it's $9.50. Yellow paint last year was $10.30 a gallon, this year it's $10. And uh, reflectorized beads are the same price at $0.50 cents a pound. Mm -hmm. So we have our own machines for doing the painting, we just want to do That's correct. Any questions? I, I must have misunderstood. What was the, the other bidder's price? The other bidder's price was <coughs> $22,520. Okay. That's a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, I heard a different number. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Great. All in favor of approving the contract for paint and uh, glass beads? Aye. Aye. Uh, next, old business, we're going to revisit the um, Church Street flooding, the King Street Brook, and the uh, the draft version of the standard operating procedures for how we move forward, keeping an eye on that area. Would that be known as the return of the beavers? I don't know. I don't know. It is. It would be. We had a, um, we had a, a hidden tour meeting yesterday um, to talk about the, uh, the draft SOP that the board looked at the last meeting. Um, and I've got a number of notes um, on, the, uh, on the SOP that um, we all came up with, uh, basically. Things that we liked that, about what we did, the things that uh, we did that we wanted to change, and information that we, that's changed based on the work that was accomplished. And one of the main things that's changed is that the design of that basin by the bike path is supposed to have a three-foot sump below the outlet to the culvert. That three-foot sump was uh, sort of a key piece of the SOP because the SOP said when that sump gets full, that was one of the uh, things that we were going to look for when we had to start cleaning the basin. Um, turns out that that sump doesn't exist. Um, the <coughs> riprap goes right to the bottom the outlet of the culvert. Um, so it sort of changes the mechanisms of, of how and when we might want to clean the culvert. Um, so we're looking we're looking into other um, aspects that we'll look at to decide when to clean the when to clean the culvert. Um, and one of them is the hydraulic capacity of the culvert. How much water can that pipe pass? And then look at various amounts of sediment within the pipe to see how much uh, how much hydraulic capacity we lose when sediment starts to accumulate in there. Um, so we, in our meeting earlier this week, we started to talk about something that might be more of a temporary SOP that we <coughs> that we look at doing now to determine when we want to clean the culvert. Um, Richie's been checking the culvert in the basin every morning on the way in the, on the way into work, and um, that's how we're we're cognizant of all the the beaver activity out there right now backing up water in the said basin and it's backing up water through the culvert so the, the culvert's actually partially full with water right now if you go up and take a look at it. So um, 
suffice to say that we're still working on the SOP and until we get some hydraulic calculations done that allow us to tie it a little bit more, um, tie it to something um, technical, um, we won't be able to finish that SOP in a formal, you know, yeah. in a formal format. So I don't know if you want to talk about the rest of Church Street while we're on this on the SOP. Or is it, it's informational under number one. Let me just uh, make a comment. I think since our last meeting. Um, if I have my timeline right, there's, we had really heavy rain about 10, uh, maybe a little over a week ago. Rain hard for two hours. And um, we had gotten some text messages from the residents. And I was coming back from cold rain uh, from a job, and I, I just went over there. And it was raining so hard, I went to get an umbrella first. So it was a, a, a reasonable test. If not a 50-year flood, it was a good example of hard rain. And the channel that the guys cleared out through the debris on the upstream side, which would be south of the bike path, they had pulled apart some debris to make a clear channel. It was running like a little river. It, it looked great. There was no sense that the water was pooling on the upstream side of the bike path. It was just shooting right through the channel. And if you then walked over to the stop and shop side of the bike path, it was clearly spreading out with a good flow, good strong flow in four or five different directions at once. It was very encouraging. So, and just to help you picture what Jim was saying, on the stop and shop side of this culvert, we had been under the impression there was a nice hole that the water could fall down into, the sediment could collect in, and then occasionally we'd go into the back hole and dig out the sediment. It turns out now that it's all cleared out that it's, a, it's just a straight runway. There's no, there's no dip that the sediment can collect in. And because the water is backing up in the culvert, if any sediment coming down the brook settles out now, it's more apt to settle at the inlet or in the pipe itself and to make it all the way through. Uh, so that's one of the urgent reasons why we need to trap the beaver and keep removing the beaver dams that are blocking water within the marsh. So we haven't heard that, but so as you saw, we've asked for permission to trap the beavers. We haven't heard, we haven't gotten permission, and we haven't heard from people who in the past have been concerned about the prospect of trapping and killing them. We're going to receive the approval from the Board of Health tomorrow. Okay. And we did send information to the people that didn't like trapping of the beaver. And oh, I haven't, great. I haven't, okay. heard, haven't heard anything from them. In, in the long run, clearly we're going to have to look at that whole marsh and figure out, look at why it's back. I mean, we know why it's backing up. But we might have to deal with that eventually because that water level is a little bit too high to let the, let the water rush right through. That's all. So, yeah. Well, I, I also I was, um, I went down Barrett Street and I took a look at the over there because I was just curious about well, what drains the marsh and it turns out it's a couple of two foot pipes. I didn't measure the pipes, but they're no bigger than two feet, which is a lot less area than a four by four box culvert. So at a certain point, you know, there is some hydraulic capacity for storage, obviously, because if you stand on Barrett Street and you look into the swamp, you can see, I think, two, two levels of beaver dams. So if those were gone, obviously, there'd be plenty of uh, water storage, that's a pretty big area. So I can't imagine that you'd ever back up the, uh, the King Street Brook if those beaver dams were gone. But at some point, I mean, if <coughs> that thing were full, I guess it would either overflow Barrett Street, which I guess is done, we know that. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know what the difference is in the inverts. We, uh, we've shot all those inverts yeah. and we've shot the water elevations behind those beaver dams and we have profiles of the water through there. Um, taking out the beaver dams in the marsh would be a big job, Re would require a few permits to do that, yes, but that's something that, that's something that we're looking at right now. Yes. Um, clearly that used to be a drainage channel through the marsh and now yes. it's nothing, nothing like the drainage channel. It's right. a series of beaver ponds and right. backed up water and something of quest questionable functionality. Mm -hmm. um, but until we fully understand 
how it functions or how it's intended to function, um, it's hard to make the case to do a lot of work within the marsh itself. Right. Um, and that's something that we're something we're working on right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Rich, did, yes. do I remember that you said that you've seen the water overflowing, Barrett? Yes, over the road. Over the road, over like the road. a good healthy stream. Or? Right over the road. So you basically the box the box culvert goes underneath the road is full to capacity. And the water is risen over the top and riding over the road. You can still drive through it, but you pretty much should have a pickup truck. And that's been, that was not at this last event that we had before Memorial Day, but the last flooding event that we had, which I think was Hurricane Irene, is when it was going over the road. Yeah. And it's gone over the road, and multiple times we've had a lot of rain. Uh, I mean, you know, three, four inches. And that's when the beaver dams get completely inundated and they just, the water just goes over the top of them and it's just it's out of control. So it's, it's, it's you know, regularly in correlation when you have the flooding on Church Street is when that is right at the level and it's about to go over the road where Church Street starts to back up. And actually the other day when we had that heavy rain on Friday, I was down there observing the fact that somewhere farther up in the King Street Park between where it comes out of the culvert behind Winter Street, that, that it had jumped its banks. So, you know, even though all the work that we've done, it's still, there's a lot more work to do. Um, and it was slowly filling up that whole um, wetland area now that's behind uh, Winter Street. Didn't and reach State and Stoddard. No, and, that, and it didn't go that far, but you could actually stand there and watch it, and it was right. just coming out in a trickle into that little channel that runs along parallel things like that. So the problem with the channel is it's not deep enough to handle the flows, although you saw, you saw a lot of water making it to the culvert under a really large storm the channel is too meandering and it's not deep enough to handle the flow, so it'll jump the banks. So one of the other things that we started to look at was the permitting necessary to dredge the channel to straighten it and make it deeper so it can handle the, the amount of water that we're expected to see coming out of that 36 inch pipe at Winter Street. So that's one. Did you pick up the invert of that pipe? We did. Yeah. Is that any higher than the box cover? It's about three foot, uh, it's around three feet of grade difference. Really? Yeah. Because that pipe seemed to me was well below, the invert of that was well below the average elevation of the channel. That's what I was sort of standing there looking at. It seemed like that pipe was sort of in a deep pool and then the bottom of the channel was higher. Maybe a couple of feet. That's about three feet down through there. 142.36 is the outlet by Winter Street, and 139.98 is the invert in at the box culvert. So, <coughs> I think you guys have been doing a great job. The neighbors seem very pleased with it. Uh, Councilor Carney seems very pleased. Um, it's, I think our response has been uh, terrific. I would agree. I agree too. I, I agree too. I have one more question now. You have this great map of the drainage basin for King Street Brook. Do you have another one for uh, everything that goes into the uh, Barrett Street? Market? We do. Did I, did I not send you both of those, or we do have no, one? No, we. Ours starts the just below the bike path and goes north. I think it's well, just. You, have, you haven't seen what I sent. I never sent it to you. No. Else got <laughs> Gary got it. Gary got it. Gary got it, and David got it because they they asked uh, me for it. We have a lot Barrett of Barrett Street drainage basin. The every the Barrett Street everything uh, everything that goes into the to the Barrett Street marsh that goes through the King Street book behind CVS all the way up to the Connecticut. We have one, and that's like 530 acres or something. And and the Roundhouse lot. I mean around the Roundhouse uh, King Street book upstream of the. Of the path is one hundred one sixty one or something. Yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. Why do you ask? Good size of it. I was just curious. I don't. I don't know. Round, round hill all the way to Tower Park. All the roads maybe. One sixty one to the culvert. And that's, that's five hundred and twelve goes in the entire watershed. Five hundred twelve acres. Right. Goes that goes to the culvert at ninety one. Yeah, that's as big as the entire downtown that drains toward the uh, wastewater plant. It's a very large area, yeah. and that's why we're you know we're concerned about it. I mean, you've got these huge beaver dams in the middle of the thing. And yeah. How is it supposed to function? The city's done work out there in the past. 
Those culverts under Barrett Street were built in 96. The King Street Brook on the other side of Barrett Street was built in 97. I remember out. watching them dredge the channel beyond Barrett Street, heading towards the river. They went through there and they put the articulated concrete yes. block mm -hmm. um, thing in there. And, and we've had complaints from a woman that lives on Denise Court over by that, that she's been flooded in the last few months twice. She left me another message today about wanting to talk to us about issues down there. When was the last time we walked the, that reach from, from there all the way to King Street or wherever it goes into a parking lot? I was out there with Richie a couple weeks ago. Is the channel, are the beavers in that channel? No. No, no. no there is a beaver deceiver in there. Because uh -huh. there was a beaver dam in there at one time, but that's all been gone. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. Great. <coughs> uh, next uh, is the credit policy for the stormwater and flood control um, enterprise fund. We've made a few changes to this credit policy since the board saw it last. Um, Doug is, Doug's handing out a copy of that right now with the track changes so you can see what the changes are. Um, the majority of Ch changes are relatively minor in my mind. Um, there's a few, and we can flip through, I think we can flip through page by page if you want to do that. It's the stuff in blue? Yes. Do you want to go page by page through and we can explain what we've got there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Page one, we inserted the section number and the date of the code of ordinance as, a, as approved by the council. Um, we've got some minor changes on page two. Um, relative to, uh, there's a half a dozen bullets down there. Credit applications will only be reviewed if they're filled out completely and all necessary information and submissions are attached. Um, we bumped up the time. Um, for incorporation of the credit into the bill from two weeks to one month. And that was based on the discussion I think Doug had with Anne Marie mm -hmm. um, to, to see how that coordination would work and make sure we could do it. Um, on page three, for the small residential uh, stormwater improvement credit, um, we added a little bit of language to say that gravel driveways aren't considered a type of porous pavement without appropriate subsurface design. So just because you have a, a driveway that's not uh, doesn't have asphalt doesn't mean you automatically get the credit. You need to have a pervious um, sort of a porous design for your driveway that, um, that would support the credit application. Um, there is on page five, education credit, a minor change here uh, to the third bullet down under the application process. Um, so we're talking about to receive the credit, the applicant has to submit the following information. The third bullet was submittal of a public service program information or other type of program. This third bullet we see more applicable to Smith College. We we're hoping um, that they will, they will assist us meet some of the MS4 requirements that we have for public service programming. Um, but we want to leave it open to them if they have other types of um, application or programs that they want to try we would be open to <coughs> considering those. That was the intent there. On page six, um, the protected land credit. The change here is that um, we're proposing to make the credit automatic um, rather than have an application form filled, be filled out because we can get this information um, directly because the city has records um, on what property it is protected, whether through Chapter 61 or through an APR or CR. So what we're proposing to do is to take the information from the assessor's office and incorporate that into the billing system so people get the reduction of 20% or 50% as described here in Section 2.5. And will this, that designation, um, obviously the permanent restrictions are permanent, but in terms of being qualified for chapters 61 and 61A, 61 61 is that um, updated annually? It is. Is there is. some mechanism that... It would be updated <coughs> annually. Um, 
Because so. the tax assessor needs the same information. That's correct. Okay. <coughs> so similarly under that's a nice change by the way. On page uh, on page ten, um, section two point eight and two point nine, we're doing something similar here where um, if we we can get information from the assessor's office about the people, so under 2.8, the senior needs based credit, we can get a list from the assessor's office of people that are already approved for Chapter 41C tax exemption. So we would apply this 50% reduction in fee automatically to the people on the list that we get from the assessor's office, and that um, that would be reviewed annually. We get an, an updated list annually. So it's an ongoing credit. People, nice. people don't, don't need to charge. And uh, 2.9, the same thing, low income credit, we can get uh, uh, a similar list from the assessors, that, and this was based on the CPA tax surcharge exemption. We get that on automatic list. If you're on that list, then you get the credit, and the credit's ongoing as long as you're qualified and you're on it. On page 11, um, 3.2, this is the incentive program now. So 3.2 is a, a technical outreach program. Originally we had this drafted as sort of a free assistance program where people could call us and we would, um, <coughs> yet the concept would be that we would, we would talk to people one-on-one -on -one and potentially visit their property and give them some input um, site specific that might help them do some type of green record that would result in a credit. Um, we don't really have the staff time to do that type of thing. I was envisioning coming in one day and having 50 calls, which wouldn't be a lot of the community even, but it would be a ton for us to, to deal with. So um, we decided to, to be a little more proactive in providing information to the community as a whole through the use of periodic workshops, we were, where we would hold workshops to provide technical information about um, things like rain gardens, a forest pavement, other systems that residents might be able to use to get a, um, a reduction on their uh, on their fee. So that that was the main change under 3.2 was to have more organized outreach rather than react to calls that we receive. And then there were some minor. Um, minor changes to the credit applications that re that reflect sort of the automatic nature of the credits that we talked about a minute ago, the land credits and the income-based credits. I have a question, is the, um, the annual review of the various people who apply for this credit or that credit or the various properties, um, is that so automatic that it's unnecessary to have that in writing somewhere that they shall be reviewed annually on our side? Is it so automatic that... I'm in other sure. words, it, I, I can imagine... You, you could... I can imagine poking around, something comes up, some issue comes up a few years from now and finding that, well, actually, no one's actually looked at get that stuff for a couple of years. Um, we have we would put a system in place to check it check it annually and we had a meeting with the city's financial team to, and, and actually I'd love to take the credit for all these changes and I'm sure Doug would too but I think it was universal agreement among people on the city's financial team that it would be, it would be better to automate these because people a lot of residents will call City Hall looking looking to right. determine how do we apply and you know there'd be a lot of questions so it would make it easier just to automate them. And we talked in a meeting recently about the transfer of updated lists from City Hall to DPW to Henry so we could make sure that everything was up to date. So a system could be put in place fairly readily to update it. Okay, that sounds great. So if, if these three categories are done automatically, do they even need to show up in the application? Um, there's no other way people will know because it's not in the ordinance. Um, so I think it's one way of advertising the fact that if you meet one of these requirements that you will get it automatically. Now the other 
But they don't need to fill out this form. No, they don't. they don't. They don't need to. But fill it's out. in our credit. This is yeah. also kind of a credit policy. The reason it's still, the re it's, it has to be in the credit policy, and the reason it's still shown this, they're shown on one on this form here, and that's because if you have, if you're a property owner, you can get multiple credits up to a maximum of fifty percent. So we needed to keep it on this form. If you get twenty percent land credit automatically, you're still eligible up to thirty percent. And we wanted to make sure that you don't get more than 50. So that would be sort of the accounting of it. City engineer always has an answer. He's the yeah. best. Oh, no. he has a Rock on. I have a calculator. <laughs> I know what a BMP is, but it doesn't say anywhere on this form what a BMP is. So. That's in the policy, but well, yeah, thanks. we can but, mention but it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else asked that question yeah. in the meeting. Somebody that didn't know. They just spelled the word. They spelled the word bump. <laughs> <laughs> I think to apply for a bump. Please. One of the things that we are wrangling with in terms of these automatic credits is how to notify people. We haven't actually figured out how to do this because we have very we have a lot we have um, significant limitations within our billing system to put it information in there, like you're getting a credit and show up on, on the bill as it comes out. So at the last meeting that we had about a week ago, Andrew was going to be looking to see if there was a way within Eunice to put a line in there that indicates and acknowledges that you're getting, you're a senior and you're getting one of the credits that you are in fact getting the credit to show this is your fee, this is your credit, this <coughs> is your billable amount. Turns out it's not that easy within our accounting system to modify an invoice in that manner. So she was looking to see if that could be done or if we needed to do some other mechanism like an annual letter that would go out with a bill and, uh, as a bill stuff or something that indicates that um, you are getting this credit for this year and describe how it works so that people will get that type of information. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that we don't have the final answer on right now. Do we need to approve this tonight? That would be great. We should get that um, in the record before move, we start sending out bills. I move we approve the uh, credit incentive policy as revised and distributed tonight. Second. Any other questions or comments? I think these all, these all look like great changes, and I like I like the the idea of automating the credits. Okay. So I've worked really hard on this. This is really. Really good thing to put it together. Thank you, Doug. Nice, Doug. All right. When does the first bill go out? Where uh, we we'll, let's talk, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Um, so, all in favor of approving the credit policy as it's been uh, modified? All right. Aye. Great. Jim, you want to give us an update on the. I don't, I don't have a specific date at this point. The plan is for the first quarter bills to be sent out in the second quarter when the second quarter bills go. Great. The first quarter bills are going to go out in the second quarter? Right. Oh, right. I see what you're saying. Right. Right. So that would be next year, right? October. Oh, we're talking yeah, about October. fiscal year. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the first quarter. quarter of the fiscal year is June, July, August. August. So July, August, August September. September. Wait, would be... July, oh, August. July, right, exactly. Right. July, August, August, September is the first quarter, yes. right? So then bills would go out in, in like October. October. Yeah. Okay, fine. Possibly a little earlier. For some of them, or we've given up on that? I think we've given up on it. I think that uh, they're going to go out in the second quarter. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a double bill. Mm -hmm. First time. Okay. The first time, wait. The first and second quarter. They'll get their first and second quarter bills during the second quarter. And the third quarter, they'll get their third quarter bill. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's the I guess, excuse me for being dense. Yeah, here's but, the issue, Mary. Yeah. The, um, we, we hired a consultant engineering company yeah. to help us uh, clean up the databases that were involved. We, there's lots of overlapping data, yeah. but someone had to go in parcel by parcel, right. cleaning up little anomalies right. and getting everything ready for actual billing. And that process was initially thought to be a three-month process. Right. Is it a five-month process? So, and then the city's accounting system yeah. isn't as flexible as one might hope. Right. And, and the assessor's office and the 
water department water billing system use different account numbers they all got to talk to there's a million little debt so did you guys hire a database consultant did somebody we we hired an engineering firm to help us with the technical information we needed to calculate the bills and that that's one of the items that we're still working on finalizing okay and so but the bills are going out with the water and sewer bills right yes correct so how can you get billed during a quarter when it hasn't been determined how much somebody has used during that quarter yet. That's why we're holding off on the first round of the first set of bills. The first set of bills, but I'm sorry, but. Water and sewer will still go out, water. but there won't be the third line item for stormwater. But when water and sewer goes out, <coughs> like let's say water and sewer goes out for third or fourth quarter, that's actually for the quarter before of what they've used, right? Like when you, if generally, without this, <coughs> If you received a water and sewer bill in October, mm -hmm. it would be for the first quarter of the fiscal year, right? right? <coughs> Excuse me. The water and sewer bills are going out like they always go out. Yeah. The stormwater fee is a flat, is basically a flat it's fee. A flat. Right. So it doesn't depend on usage. Oh, it doesn't matter. It right. Doesn't okay. Matter. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. Thanks. And for a so typical homeowner, yeah. instead of a twenty-five dollar <coughs> quarterly fee, it'll be a fifty dollar for that first one. Right. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Okay. And they're good questions, and the mayor's office is working on a press release and a mailing to the residents to let them know about the rollout of the fees, so people know when they get the, when they can expect to get the bill and, and they answer to some of the questions that you're asking. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, reuse committee. The building. Uh, the building, I've signed a building permit. Um, a Metcalf uh, Architects has been the uh, person who will be signing off on the final permit for Louis Hasbrook. I'm waiting for the return of that permit from Louis Hasbrook now. There's a volunteer group uh, that's ready to go in there Saturday and start some demolition work. We're just waiting for that permit from Louis at this point. Didn't we have some one of Louis issues with that permit? Not from my phone conversation yesterday with him. Right. So, so they may be able to start Saturday? That they should be underway. That's the, that's the game plan. And the group, the group knows this? Um, yes, I talked with Susan Wade about that yesterday. The group has a meeting on Friday. Oh, good. Money's coming from where? Um, there's $10,000. There's a budget of $10,000 that's in the wastewater or um, solid waste enterprise fund doesn't mean that, you know we don't not that we hope to spend 10 but there's a little bit of a budget there for working on this it's open to just sticker holders or just open to those so. they envision an opening up to the public of Northampton at this point not contributors yeah. this is on this state property or are you talking about at the it's at the Glendale Road the Glendale Road property. yeah okay Definitely. You should talk to those. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. it's an interesting group. And she's, got, way, she's your new. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but some of the people in that group have experienced doing this in other communities. And it's it's more, there's more going on than I ever would have thought. Yeah. They're meeting on Friday? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Let's try to go. 8.30 here. 8.30 a.m.? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> <in this morning. laughs> Jim, do you think we've covered the flooding issue, or do you have more you'd like to say? I think we have probably covered it. We're working on a bunch. We're working on a number of other things that were outlined in the um, the update email that went on on Friday. Um, you can read that. But some curbing and driveway issues and some other longer term issues. Um, actually, the board, uh, all, all, all the, a lot of the board members have come to talk to me um, with ideas, which I appreciate. David was in my office um, two days ago, and Gary's talked to me, and Terry and Mike, and everyone has really been great about coming up with ideas. Uh, but we're taking a look at the whole thing. Gary? Tell us about your accident? Or? No. <laughs> I, uh, maybe in private I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can tell you look where. I didn't break any bones. I did break my bicycle. Whoa. Um, where? Um, 
on the edge of Elm Street as they were entering the sidewalk. My front wheel fell off. I mean, you had a mechanical? Yeah, equipment failure. Or mm -hmm. you could say the mechanics failure. Who happens to be the operator? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Check that one more time. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how we're doing on attendance for July 9th, but I probably won't be here. I also will not be here. I will be here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a guest presentation from our favorite forester, July 9th. Which I'd be happy to reschedule if you would like us to do so. Was that the one that wrote Shoot. me? I don't know. Well, we're <coughs> right at the quorum limit, missing three people. Right. Um, and when, when's Taylor and Howard? August 20th? Six in my mind? August 20th, I think. Wasn't it in the middle? So August 20th. Uh, if we... How about July 16th? If we... Oh, I can't do it. You could still have two meetings. 16th and 30. How about if we, go, if we skip the first one and do the 23rd? Is that too far away? Do the 16th, do one right in the middle. I like that one. I like we that do, one. We can do any of those. Uh, it's the August meeting, I don't, the August 20th meeting. I don't think I'm going to be here. That's where we're going to have a field trip. We're going out to the waste of mm -hmm. uh, drinking with the uh, water filtration plant. Very really? exciting. On the 20th? Mm -hmm. 20th? Mm -hmm. Of August? August 20th. Road trip? No. Road trip. Are we going in a van? And there's going to be free water? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> free drinks for everyone. Um, all right, so regarding the July meeting, um, oh, yeah, thoughts so on splitting the difference? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, let's say that it's the 16th then. Thank so, kid, and you ask the forester if he can make that work. I will. Would that be Chris Matera? It would not be. Mike Mori? Mike Mori. Good guess. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up, Mike. Ned? I'm all set. Thank you. Yeah? Who'd you see? Back. Ah. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> it was a great show. It was. Yeah. Are you there too? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really remember? <laughs> We're recording this. You might have some memory issues. You want to say? Me? Yes. Yes. I don't know if you're looking at me or BJ. <laughs> oh, BJ. You you had your head down. I thought. Oh. No, I'm good. Thank yeah. you. Good. Good enough. Good. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. I don't think anything. We'll return. Yeah. yeah. Second. Excellent. Oh, Hi. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone.